The following podcast may contain some strong language and feature some adult themes. Listener discretion is advised. All your feet are firmly on the ground. Your imagination You're listening to Strange New Worlds and Spaced Out Tales, a science fiction anthology audio drama series. Episode 5, The Aremberg Principle. The infinite vastness of space. The supermassive scale and the unimaginable beauty of it. After five long years at the Space Academy, pulling 14-hour days of study, I, Danny Ace Oswald, graduated in the top 1% of my year group, gaining the highest honours. And above all else, I majored in the most in-demand and prestigious discipline, astral navigation. I was destined for a stellar, or rather, interstellar career on a state-of-the-art starship. I was born to be out here, among the stars. Sanitation engineer Danny Arswipe, come in, over. <sighs> Scraggs, what the hell do you want? You're supposed to say over when you finish a sentence over the radio. Over. Fine. What the hell do you want? Over. Just a bit of harmless banter. Pass the time a bit. Over. Scraggs, you know we're not supposed to use the radio unless there is an emergency. Cheeseman will shit the bed if he catches you. Oh, we definitely got one of those too, Danny. Where are you? Over. I'm just finishing mopping the main corridor on D-level. Again? What's that? The fourth time this week? Fifth. It's Cheeseman's idea of teaching me not to get above my station, apparently. And what could possibly constitute an emergency for the sanitation team? Oh, it's serious, Danny. Brown alert. Over. Scraggs, what the bloody hell are you talking about? You didn't say over, over... Seriously, Scraggy, tell me what you want, or I swear I'll come and find you and impale you with this mop. Christ, chill out, man. You're always so uptight. Anyway, the officers had one of their calorific formal dinners last night. Cut to the chase, Scraggs. Righto. It appears one of the officers overindulged in the lamb vindaloo. Got a Class A bog blocker for you to deal with up on B level. Main toilets. Third cubicle. You can't miss it. It's the size of a bloody walrus. Oh, come on, Scraggs. I got tons of work to do down here still. Can't you sort it out? Piss off. I'm about to go on my break. And Cheese Man specifically instructed me to assign this one to you especially. He really doesn't like you, Danny boy. Reckon you'll need the really big plunger. And better bring the respirator. It stinks to high heavens in there. Over. So, yes, I'd made it out to the stars. I was on the state-of-the-art starship. Oh, dear God! Needless to say, this is not how things were supposed to have turned out. If you'd have told me, back at the Space Academy, that one day I'd be dealing with the senior bridge officer's logs, This very definitely isn't what I'd have imagined that to mean. So you're probably wondering, what the hell happened? How did I end up in this situation? Well, it all came down to this one massive and incredibly stupid mistake. The night I messed it all up. My final night at the Academy. The graduation party.
This is it, man. You and me, Aces Ruster. We're like done with the academy. Next stop up there. We're going up into space and we're gonna like kick its ass. That's Morgan, my supposed closest friend at the academy. And he would play a huge part in my sudden fall from grace. Seriously, Morgan? Thruster? That's the best space handler you could come up with. Look, you're Mr. Fancy Pants Astral Navigator. Ace is a suitably dynamic, if horribly tacky nickname. But it sums up what you do, right? Me? I'm all about propulsion, man. I do thrust. Morgan's speciality, if you can call it that, was spaceship propulsion. As with most things in spaceflight, there was the academic side of things. You had to learn all of the theory and pass exams in it. There is actually a lot of theory involved in spaceship propulsion, and Morgan knew next to nothing about it. He flunked nearly every test, but unlike astral navigation, none of that really mattered. Because in practice, all it took to carry out the actual duties of a propulsion engineer was the ability to press a single button. Computerized AI took care of about 90% of the serious business of spaceflight. The human being was supposed to be there almost as merely a failsafe. And even that was nonsense. In reality, though it was a human that pressed the single button, it was the AI that decided the exact nanosecond when the thrusters actually fired and how much power was required. As a result of this, people like Morgan, who were barely competent enough to tie their own shoelaces, could blag their way through five years at the academy, barely scraping a pass. And thanks in no small part to having a rich family with connections in all the right places, Morgan could look forward to an extremely highly paid career as a propulsion engineer. And Morgan's family were very, very rich. He was literally too dumb to comprehend just how much of a lucky bastard he really was. Of course, for all your success and achievement, you are still yet to claim the ultimate prize, Danny boy. Well, look, Morgan, I don't know how to tell you this. I did actually manage to lose my virginity in my first year at the Academy. No, you cheeky bastard. I'm talking about the highest prestige. You might be the Academy Golden Boy, academically speaking, but I'm talking about enshrining yourself in the legend. What the hell are you going on about? The Big Dipper. What, seriously? 100% serious. Morgan, that's kid stuff. And after the accidents, the Academy have totally forbidden it. I mean, they've put in a solid steel reinforced door to get out onto the roof of the building. I'm guessing you don't have the key? You guess wrong, my friend. Shit. How the hell did you get all of that? I'm a people person. What? I paid the right people! Wow, money sure does talk round here, I guess. But we'd still need a skateboard. I can see from here you haven't got one of those hidden up your sleeve. Got one tucked away in a locker out in the lobby. What, really? And that was the moment I should have seen reason, made the correct adult choice, and not elected to jeopardise my entire future, my life even, for a daft stunt. But I didn't. It's all set up. We just have to slip out of here. Grab the board and sneak up the main stairwell. I don't know. Are you going to jump? Bloody hell no. You're the hero. It's your right. I'd just be filming it. And be the one to keep you pushed at the top. Remember, I'm all about propulsion. No one has done this and walked away in nearly ten years. All the more reason then. Death or glory. Glory is good. Death, not so much. No one has actually died trying them. I've come pretty close. You come pretty close to dying every time you cross the streets. We're Space Academy graduates about to actually go and work on starships out in space. Our whole careers are going to be spent living and working within a pressurized bubble with nothing but a thin layer of metal between us and no lifeless void. We laugh in the face of danger. The Dean and the Vice-Chancellor will want to string us up for this. What are they going to do? Expel us from the Academy? Uh, hello, we literally just graduated. 
Right now, you could defecate in the vice chancellor's study and wipe your backside on the curtains, and he wouldn't be able to do a damn thing. Come on, that's our glory immortality back in. Okay, let's do this. I guess it was the intoxicating mix of alcohol and sheer hubris. It was so very, very stupid. The Big Dipper, for those unfamiliar, started out as a freshman initiation challenge back when faster than light travel was very much in its infancy. New students would often challenge each other to try increasingly reckless and risky stunts to boost their standing among their peers. One such stunt was launching yourself off the sloping roof of the Great Hall on a skateboard. I'm not kidding, it's every bit as daft as it sounds. Assuming you travelled straight and true, at the point you left the roof of the Great Hall, the drop wasn't too bad, and your impact would be cushioned by the exotic and very dense foliage of the Academy's ornate flower garden. In those early days, it was very common to see a student-shaped crater in the flower bed, with the brave souls who managed it suffering no more than minor bruising and a hefty reprimand from the Academy's garden maintenance crew for damaging the flowers. But that was then, when the Great Hall of the Academy was, well, less great, and the roof 20 metres lower. As the Academy expanded, successive levels were added to the Great Hall and what was once a gentle slope now took on almost roller coaster like proportions. The drop into the flower bed at the end was still the same, but the run from the very top of the roof was a much higher and much more dangerous proposition. And with that, the Big Dipper went from being a mere freshman initiation challenge to being the ultimate prestige stunt for the high achieving student looking to seal their legacy at the Academy at graduation. Here we are, Danny Boy, top of the bloody world. Jesus Christ, Morgan. Are you absolutely sure about this? It's a hell of a long way down. Since the expansion of the Great Hall, only two students had successfully managed the Big Dipper. Their names burned into Academy legend. Lance Daredevil Anderson was the first, who somehow achieved the perfect straight run, landing safely in the flower bed without so much as a scratch. Maria the Eagle Jones repeated the feat at the following year's graduation party, although she suffered a fractured ankle on landing. However, the year after that, Paul Gravity Boy Hansen landed heavily and broke both of his legs, one of them in three places. Despite his efforts, his attempt was deemed a failure. And it culminated in the disastrous attempt made by James Lucky Bastard Finch, who veered completely off course, left the roof of the Great Hall only halfway down the slope and plummeted some 30 metres onto a concrete walkway. He suffered a fractured skull, three crushed vertebrae and broke multiple other bones. He would never walk again. You might be wondering how he attained the nickname Lucky Bastard. This was due to the fact that upon his admission to hospital after the fall, such were the extent of his injuries, doctors only gave him a 10% chance of survival. After that, the Academy expressly forbid any future attempts at this reckless and potentially lethal stunt, installing the reinforced door to prevent access to the roof, and the tradition of running the Big Dipper more or less died out. Until that night. And yours truly. You like got this, dude. How are you going to do it? Standing on the board or sitting? Morgan, no one will be stupid enough to try this standing on the board. One false move and, well, it doesn't bear thinking about. Fair enough, right, get yourself ready, I'll get the camera roll. And there I was, a drunken idiot, sat on top of a cheap skateboard about to be pushed down the sloping roof of a giant building by an equally drunk graduate propulsion engineer. Alright, here we go, Danny boy. History awaits. Three, two, one. Launch! Things did not get off to a great start. For one... Morgan's skill at providing propulsion to a guy on a skateboard were as equally inept as his understanding of propulsion in spaceflight. He slipped as he gave me the initial shove down the roof, sending me off at a fraction of the speed he was hoping for. However, gravity soon took up the slack, and before too long I began picking up some serious momentum. Sadly, Morgan's slip also somewhat skewed my intended trajectory. 
Shit, Danny, left, 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 damn it. Steering a skateboard when you're sat on it isn't the easiest thing in the world. You have to shift your weight in the direction you're wanting to go. Changing course isn't that hard, but as I found, overcompensating was all too easy. Yeah, that's right, hang on. Whoa, other way. Right, Danny, right, Danny. Oh, shit. Lucky bastard Finch had gone off the right side of the Great Hall. I, instead, went off the left side. Shit, shit, shit! And instead of solid concrete, my fall was broken by crashing through the glass roof of the Academy's garden greenhouse. Thus ended my ill-fated attempt at the Big Dipper. Danny Ace Oswald, a name added to the equally notorious list of failures. While I was certainly luckier than Lucky Bastard Finch, I was by no means unscathed. I suffered a hefty concussion and fractured my left arm and collarbone. I had a few minor cuts from the glass, but thankfully no larger shards managed to stab or impale me. A couple of weeks in hospital and a few months rehabilitation and I was as good as new. But the real damage done was not to my physical person. I'd caused extensive and expensive damage to Academy property, but greater still... I'd willingly flouted the Academy's rules on discipline with my reckless actions. They decided to make an example of me. My graduating marks were downgraded from a stellar pass with distinction to something much more average. Officially, I was no longer their golden boy. Worse still, I'd been all signed up for my first Starship job after graduation. I'd landed the most prestigious position as Joint Chief Astral Navigator aboard the maiden voyage of the Endless Endeavour, without doubt the most advanced state-of-the-art starship ever built. On the day I left hospital, I learned that my commission had been revoked. I had been replaced. I'd lost the job. And so it was, after I'd sufficiently recovered from my injuries, that I had to try and secure a new position. The top graduates get signed up to the good starship vacancies months in advance. Everyone else had to deal with the ignominy of dealing with a careers coordinator. Mr. Oswald, yes, please take a seat. Now, let me see. Ah, yes, an astral navigator, no less. Hmm. Middling grades, that's a shame. Sir, with respect, I graduated with the top marks, the highest honours of anyone in the last five years. It was just... The incident, right? Yes, exactly. The incident. And now the official records say you absolutely didn't graduate with top marks of the highest honours of anyone in the last five years, correct? Yes, but I'm still that astral navigator. My skills were proven many times over. Were they, though? Really? I mean, they may have been about to, the first time you used them aboard a real starship, but everything you've done until now was purely in a simulator. But I was a natural. I was born to be an astral navigator. And indeed, you might still be one, Mr. Oswald. But if this is the case, you must be aware that there are no current opportunities available for the post right now. The best I can advise is that you come back in six months' time when the Blue Danube is due to return from its current mission and new crew commissions are available. You might just scrape in there. The Blue Danube? That ship is nearly two decades old. It's a junk heap. And it's just a container ship. It just does supply runs in charted space. And it's the only ship headed here in the next two years that might require an astral navigator. Look, I know it's a long shot, but the Endeavour is still in orbit. It's not due to leave on its maiden voyage until next week. I was hoping... That gig has gone, Mr Oswald. Your gravity-defying exploits saw to that. What about other positions on the ship? I mean, there must be openings elsewhere on the bridge crew? No, while your academic record certainly qualifies you in multiple disciplines, the other senior and junior roles on the bridge crew were all filled months ago. I'm sorry. What about maintenance crew? I know it's outside my field of expertise, but I could apprentice in engineering. I just want to be on that ship. The Endless Endeavour was the premium gig. The missions it would be running were cutting edge. The places it was heading barely explored. Distant areas of the known galaxy. I simply had to be aboard that ship when it left orbit. And my desperation was clearly my weakness. Ripe to be exploited. Well, no. The maintenance staff are fully crewed as well, and you're clearly no engineer, Mr Oswald. 
But there is one vacancy elsewhere on the ship, but I seriously doubt you'd consider it. The thing you have to know about careers coordinators is that they are paid to fill every available opening on starships, and they employ some clever techniques to ensure they get the job done. The bait had been attached to the hook and dangled in front of me. Anything. Seriously, I'd do it. So, Mr Oswald, how do you feel about sanitation? Um, excuse me? Sanitation engineer, an essential member of the crew. Sorry, that's that's mopping floors and unblocking toilets, right? It's a critical position, Mr Oswald. Modern starships simply cannot function if... Uh, The floors aren't mopped and the toilets aren't blocked. Look, I don't think... You want to get on the endeavour. This is the way in. I'm a qualified bridge officer. I belong on the bridge. I'm not a skid mark. This was the unflattering label bestowed upon the humble and downtrodden sanitation engineer by the spacefaring elite. They were, without exception... The very lowest of the low. Absolutely no one ever aspired to be a skidmark. Not even the skidmarks themselves. The position of sanitation engineer has great job stability, reasonable pay and benefits. Seriously? It's a wretched position that no one wants to do. Has absolutely zero standing among the crew and has no prospects whatsoever. You're wrong about the last one there. The Endeavour will be piloting a brand new development scheme. There will be opportunities for advancement to people with the right skills and the right attitude. What kind of opportunities? Job shadowing in other senior roles with a mind to promote from within. Job shadowing the bridge crew? Most likely for someone with the right skills. So I could potentially get back onto the bridge? Maybe even as an astral navigator. And the right attitude, Mr Oswald. The right attitude, being a penchant for hard work and willingness to apply yourself. You'd have to prove yourself, show that your little graduation stunt does not reflect on your true abilities. Demonstrate that you are really deserving of a second chance. If you can do that, then anything and everything is entirely possible. What do you say, Mr Oswald? And thus the bait was taken, the hook well and truly swallowed. And so it was that I did get onto the endless endeavour, but in far from the capacity I'd hoped. I had five days of orientation training, and it was here I had the deep misfortune of getting acquainted with senior sanitation supervisor Gordon Cheeseman. To all intents and purposes, my boss. Let's just say he was not the most inspirational of leaders. Okay, listen up, people. The official position is that the role of sanitation engineer is a vital and respected one. That this is a job you do with pride. Knowing you are contributing to the clean and safe functioning of this remarkable starship. I'm here to give you the harsh reality check. Let's be 100% clear. Here you are all skid marks. The very lowest of the low. The plebs of the ship. If you like, no one respects what you do, and they respect you even less for doing it. Anyone could do this job, it's just most people have made more of their lives by this point. You are the worst of the worst. You are doing this job that no one else wants because you are either too damn stupid to do anything else, or you screwed up your preferred choice of vocation to such an extent that you've never else to go. Congratulations! You have reached the very bottom. Cheeseman's philosophy of management was pretty simple. Everyone on this ship generates mess and they all take a shit at least once a day. Your job is to ensure the former is cleaned up and the latter is successfully expelled from the ship. That's literally it. Failure to achieve either of those goals 
results complaints to me. If I receive complaints, then it makes me look bad. If I'm made to look bad, then you can bet your life. I will find out which of you lazy degenerates hasn't been pulling their weight and they'll be pulling double duties for a week. If anyone becomes a troublemaker, I will punish their entire team until their colleagues kick them into line. I will not tolerate any slacking, rebellion or smart mouth wise ass banter. Don't consider me to be merely your boss. I am your despotic overlord. With any luck at all, I will never have the misfortune of having any more than the bare minimum of communication with any of you. If you keep your mouth shut and do your job, you will have a relatively simply and pain-free existence. But if you mess with me and in this trap the way of things here, you will be in a world of shit. Metaphorically and literally. Training consisted of this one single nugget of wisdom. This is mob and this is a plunger. These are the tools of your trade. I'm not going to insult what lit intelligence at least some of you have by demonstrating how to use them. The expectation is that even bunch of retrograde degenerates like you can manage to use them correctly and effectively. Anyone found not doing so will swiftly find a one or other violently inserted where the sun don't shine in order to aid your familiarity. I trust no one is stupid enough to have any questions regarding this. And with regard to me, Cheeseman had done his own work. And it's come to my attention that some of our new sanitation engineers might actually feel they are a little overqualified for this kind of work. I'm looking at you, Oswald. I've already explained what we do and how menial it is. Who betide anyone who develops delusions of grandeur here? You, Oswald, are as much of pleb as everyone else here. Perhaps even more so. Your additional skills are of no consequence. Your fancy accreditation in astral navigation will not help shifting an enormous stinking turd down a waste pipe. You are the embrace your current position. And if I suspect you are getting ideas above your station, I will bring your crashing back to reality so fast it will leave a dent in your floor. Is everyone clear on this? Especially you, Skidmark Oswald? And so, the day arrived. The endless endeavor, the pinnacle of spaceflight engineering and technology, departed its orbit and began its maiden voyage out to the beyond. And that day was to hold one more sickening gut-punch revelation for me. I was busy mopping one of the upper decks when the ship's quota of new bridge officers came aboard just prior to final departure. And among them, I spotted a very familiar face. Oh my god! Morgan! Over here! Ken, that skid mark over there is waving us there. Ah, he must be mistaken. Let's head on over to the bridge, shall we? He's coming over, friend of yours. Um... Morgan, it's me, Danny. What the hell are you doing on the Endeavour? Well, Keen, aren't you going to introduce us? Uh, yeah. Hey, Danny, this is Officer Kigley Mills, Senior Comms Specialist on the bridge. Officer Mills, this is... Danny. Hi. Pleased to meet you. Me and Morgan were at the Academy together. Yeah, it's Officer Keen, if you wouldn't mind, Danny. I wasn't aware they trained skid marks at the Academy. Yeah, I'm not really supposed to be in sanitation. Hopefully just a temporary thing, you know. Hang on. Officer Keen? You're here as part of the bridge crew. How the hell did you swing that? Oh, you, you know, got a bit of good, fortunate, right place, right time, that 
kind of thing look we have to be going. My god, they commissioned you as a propulsion engineer on the Endeavour. Seriously? King, Mills, what the hell are you dithering about here for? You're due on the bridge for pre-departure briefing. Are you fraternising with a skid mark? No way! Tin balls! You're here too! Excuse me? Danny, this is... Lawrence Tin Balls Timble, I know. You graduated from the academy the year before me. We were briefly in astral nav sim training classes together for six months. Remember you dropped the class after you passed out in the simulation and wet yourself? <laughs> oh, that is priceless. <laughs> you never mentioned that, Tin Balls. <laughs> Danny, this is Senior Bridge Officer Timble, technically my commanding officer. What, they put you in charge of something? How the hell did that happen? Okay, look here, Skidmark. I'll let you off just once, okay? As Keen has pointed out, you refer to me as Senior Bridge Officer Timble. But that's irrelevant, as you will not be referring to me at all from here on in. Do you understand? I do remember you, Danny Ace Oswald. You were the hotshot astral navigator who spectacularly destroyed their career by skateboarding off the academy roof. Clearly your skills of navigation were not all they were cracked up to be. And good riddance, we can only speculate what kind of disasters you'd have caused if they'd have actually let you be the navigator on this ship. The only thing I'll be calling you for is if the officer latrines get blocked. Beyond that, you do not exist to me. You are no one and nothing. Best of luck in your new vocation. I'm sure you've found something far more suitable. Mills, Keen, Bridge, now. <laughs> Come on, Keen. Best not to keep the top brass waiting. Nice to meet you, Danny. Twin balls? That's a good one. <laughs> Look, Danny. Morgan, what happened? You never came to visit me after the accident. You just vanished. Not a word. I couldn't. They wanted my balls over what happened with the incident. The incident? You mean when you nearly got me killed? I don't know why I listened to you. They downgraded me. They revoked my commission, Morgan. I was supposed to be navigating this ship. I was supposed to be on that bridge. It was all I ever wanted. All I dreamed of for five years, five years of struggle and toil while you pissed it up the wall and barely scraped through with a basic pass. Look, the family were able to smooth things over for me. Unbelievable. They bought you out of trouble and got you onto the Endeavour. Even though you struggled to tell one end of a starship from the other and you just moved on. You were fine with that. You didn't stop to consider what happened to me. It was me clear to me that I should keep my mouth shut, stay out of trouble, and absolutely have nothing more to do with you, Danny. I'm sorry. I... So that's how it is? Yes. I'm an officer. You're a skid mark. I'm sorry. I can't change that. We are what we are. I have to go. Yeah, piss off, Officer Keen. Don't let me hold you up. But that wasn't quite the end of it. Tin Balls certainly didn't forget me, and he made sure I didn't get off lightly for showing him up in front of his junior officers. So, Oswald, perhaps I didn't make myself clear enough. We've been out of orbit less than 24 hours, then I have a complaint about you specifically. That has to be some kind of record, I do wager. And so it was, I spent the majority of our first week after leaving orbit on a marathon nightmare shift of mopping all six lower cargo decks. After that, I did my best to keep my head down. I fell in with Scraggy, my wingman as he put it, if sanitation engineers can have such a thing, who was a bit rough around the edges but a genuine enough guy, and he introduced me to Sally Sal McLean from engineering. Scraggs obviously fancied her, but her first love was clearly the ship itself. Why are you always moping around looking all miserable, Danny? He wants to be back on the bridge where he apparently belongs. I don't belong in sanitation. I'm a- Yeah, yeah, we know. You're an arsehole navigator. Change the bloody record, Danny. Why do you want to be around those self-righteous pricks all day anyway? 
It's not the bridge crew I want to be around, it's the job. It's what I was meant to do. Bloody bridge crew, even, no, especially astro navigators, they think the sun shines out of their backsides. They've got no idea how this wonder of engineering actually works. There's four distinct social groups on a starship. Sal was prone to bestowing her wisdom upon us. Annoyingly though, most of the time she was right. So at the pinnacle, you've got your top brass. The captain, the first and second officer. Now, Captain Ironside, to give him his due, he's pretty much seen it all. And he came through before academy specialism, so he did have to study mandatory engineering. He, at least, has some idea how the ship works. First and second officers. They're half the captain's age, they've brown tongued their way through several missions. Both are just here for the prestige of serving on this ship. The captain can't go on forever, and they fancy their chances of being in the right place at the right time when the big chair becomes available. Lazy bootlicking bastards, the pair of them. Then you got your other bridge crew. Yes, Danny, astral navigators are something of a rare breed because of what they actually do, and the comm specialist is pretty technical, but the rest of them, they just push buttons. At the bottom, sadly it's you guys. I guess you lot know exactly where you fit in. Don't we just? You see, without you guys, we'd probably be up to our ankles and piss most of the time, but the ship would still get where it's going. You ain't essential. You're really making us feel special, Sal, you know that? And the bridge crew. Generally speaking, you could train a chimp to press the buttons. I'd like to see a chimp navigate a course for faster than light travel. Yeah, maybe. But the rest, they push the buttons and as far as they're concerned, they're making the ship go where they want. Bullshit! The buttons are just electrical signals that trigger the engines and the ship's industrial mechanisms to do what they're designed to do. None of them actually know what's going on below the surface. But the engineers, we do. Without us, the ship goes nowhere. Without us, you don't have any gravity. You don't have the thermal systems to stop you instantly freezing to death. Hell, without us maintaining the life support, you'd have no air to breathe. A good engineer is worth any number of your lot or the bridge crew. While I did develop a newfound respect for engineers, Sal would have thrown me out of an airlock if I didn't, and I did sort of admire Scraggy for just accepting his lot in life, I felt like the proverbial fish out of water. I had my own calling, and right now it was absolutely not being fulfilled. I did, after a couple of months into the journey, raise the subject of development opportunities with Cheeseman. That went just about as well as you'd expect. (laughs) You what? The careers coordinator back at the academy said there might be things like job shadowing, maybe chances for a bit of progression. Yeah. Right, he probably also said the moon was comprised of cheese. And you'll find space unicorns galloping free on larger asteroids. There must be something, anything. You have a role. It's not my fault you don't like it. You sign it on the dotted line. Progression. To what? Chief toilet and blocker? I don't know. What about apprenticing with the engineers? They got a quota of apprentice engineers. And unlike you, they've spent their time at the academy actually learning some useful engineering skills. Or shadowing with the bridge crew? You think they let a skid mark anywhere near the bloody bridge? Holy shit! We all want to get home safely at the end of this mission. Look, the carrier's coordinator of Lucy saw you coming. He spun you a line. Probably to fill out the last vacancies in the sanitation and qualify for his recruitment bonus. He stitched you right up, but but nothing, oh swallowed bloody delusions of grandeur. You're full of them. You know what that will get you, right? Double shifts. Now go back to work and stop wasting my time. And that was the end of that. Defeated, I just got on with it. One day blurring into the next. Mopping, cleaning, unblocking toilets, ad infinitum, ad nauseum. Space is a very repetitive place to be when you're just a glorified passenger. But now and again, when the ship emerged from an FTL jump in a new expanse of the universe, and there was actually something to see out of the observation portals, a colourful nebula or a star I'd only ever witnessed from back home on grainy, long-range images, it lifted me a little but it also served to increase the longing. But nothing compared to seeing Antares. 
Look at him, gazing at that star. Like a dog that's lost his favorite ball down a bottomless pit. Danny, it's just a star. Come sit down. It's not just any star, Sal. It's Antares and Antares B. It's a bloody binary star. It's a thing of wonder. It's a star with another star hanging around near it. Big deal. If you don't want your lunch, I'll have it before it gets cold. And it took us only five FTL jumps to get here. Although, I reckon I could have done it in four. Don't do this to yourself. It'll just make you bitter and twisted. I knew we were heading this way, but wasn't expecting us to emerge from the jump so close. Their navigator messed up, I reckon. It'll take more fuel to jump away from here. We're far closer to the star's gravitational fields than we should be. Boring. I'm having your food. It's decided. I've never understood what the big deal with astral navigation is. Why are your lot supposed to be such clever bastards anyway? Why indeed. For over two centuries, the Holy Grail was faster than light travel. Then we cracked it. The right combination of energy transfer and bingo, that was it. But while travel in short, safe distances became child's play, longer distances were a different matter. The calculations involved to ensure you didn't emerge from FDL on an immediate collision course with an asteroid or planet or even inside the heart of a star were immense. It was eventually mastered thanks to what became known as the Arenberg Principle. It is possible to explain the Arenberg Principle. Countless books, scientific journals and academic papers have been published on the subject of it. But here's the thing. Putting it into practice, that's a skill few people have. To all intents and purposes, an astral navigator is presented with current and intended future locations. While travelling at FTL speed, the path between these two points in space and all points in between are in true clarity before you. Time behaves extremely differently at FTL speeds. There are new rules and no such thing as constants. It's a moving, dynamic, fluid situation and at the centre of it, the astral navigator in the ship, somehow making sense of it all. Arenberg first theoretically proposed his principle decades ago, but although the mathematical fundamentals, as complicated as they were, could be proven on paper, it took a special and extremely rare type of human mind to be able to interpret them. Inversely, although having a grounded understanding of the theory was compulsory at the Space Academy, the majority of students subjected to an FTL navigation simulation failed spectacularly. You have to be mentally wired up just right to be able to navigate. 90% of students lost consciousness within the first 30 seconds of a simulation. Navigators they would never be. Of the remaining 10%, half of those were unable to get even 50% of the way through. Of the 5% who could get to the end, most couldn't navigate safely or consistently. Most would never consent to try it again. The 1%, they were the special ones. Simulation after simulation, seemingly as if without trying, they were able to achieve what so many could not. And I was one of them. Navigation, for me, was both a physical and spiritual experience, like I could reach out and manipulate the cosmos around me, bend it to my will. Navigators don't use theory or book learning. They do it purely by instinct and by feel. The other thing that made them so completely unique is that while AI could easily handle pretty much everything else relating to getting a starship from one place to another at FTL speeds, no AI had ever been created that could adhere to the Arenberg principle as naturally, successfully and above all as safely as a skilled navigator. Not even close. It was the last bastion of human superiority over the machine. It was a pretty big deal. Sounds like a load of old horseshit to me. Amen to that. Anyway, you know this is pirate territory? Excuse me, what? Come off it, in space? What are you going on about? Yeah, it's uncharted space, Sal. Uncharted by the home planets, yes. But we don't have the absolute monopoly on the stars. And FTL travel isn't new. Are you talking about the rogue colonies? Come off it, that's just crazy talk. No one has gone out this far before. That's what they tell you at the academy. But it's not true. The rogue colonies were the early pioneers, the first FTL travellers who pushed the known boundaries. Over time, some of them settled and colonised habitable planets or built permanent orbiting stations. Distance from the home planets being what it was, sometimes they broke away from their ties to home, 
a fresh start, a new way of doing things, new lives, new opportunities. But space wasn't just limited to colonists and scientists and explorers. As FTL became more viable and widespread, then huge corporations also set forth to snap up their own distant bits of the universe, seeking to exploit the incredible and abundant resources that were suddenly within reach. They created autonomously ruled planet states, no longer bound by the rules and regulations of the home planets. Conflict, as is so often the case, occasionally reared its ugly head. If a ship accidentally emerged from an FTL jump in the immediate vicinity of your territory, then it was fair game. Don't get me wrong, we're not talking about big epic laser battles in space, that was still only the stuff of movies and fantasy. Space combat, for want of a better phrase, was so impractical as to be virtually impossible. But piracy, forcibly boarding an interloper's ship and taking it by force? Certainly a little closer to home, that was absolutely a thing. But all the way out here? The so-called rogue colonies, a name I might add given to them to make them sound inferior and backward, are far from a ragtag bunch of space amateurs. They've had FTL travel as long as us. Hell, they are basically us. They were the early explorers. They haven't reverted into backwater savages. They've colonized entire worlds. They've carved out vast empires. This very binary star is practically on the doorstep of several of the most far-reaching. You mean... We may not have been the first to come here. Of course we're not. The earliest colonies were pretty much halfway there. They've had a head start. Who knows how much further beyond what we consider to be uncharted space they've gone. And how do you claim to know all this, Sal? I've been working starships for two decades. Since you, Danny, were in nappies. And you, since you crawled out of whatever cave you were spawned in. Easy, Tiger. No need to get personal. You've witnessed space piracy. Damn straight I have. Mostly the after effects of it. While I was on board the Orion, we found the derelict wreck of the King Charles out near Barnard Star. She'd been practically hollowed out, everything of any value stripped, the crew all flushed out of an airlock, some 250 souls. Hang on, the King Charles was a catastrophic reactor failure, it was on the news. Yeah, that was the official line. Total bullshit, that ship had no residual signs of a radiation leak and the reactor itself had been painstakingly dismantled and removed. It was an extremely professional job. But I've got first-hand experience as well. The Orion got attacked between jumps on the way to Proxima. A bunch of jokers attempted aborting. Unfortunately for them, they had no idea we had a detachment of marines on board. They shot the shit out of them. It was pretty dramatic. But how to you? The chances of it, well, they're slim? You said it yourself. The Navigator messed up getting us here, right? Well, yeah, I'd say so, but it's subjective. I mean, I wouldn't have had us emerge this close to the star. But emerging where we have, would you say that a move like that wouldn't draw attention if anyone happened to be scanning this part of the system? That is true. Emerging from FDL this close to a star basically lights up your location like a beacon. We're detectable right now from thousands of kilometers away. And what's that? A day's FTL jump from the nearest known habitation center? The new landers are rumored to have orbiting platforms right the way through the outskirts of the system. They could arrive potentially any second. Seriously? You're being paranoid. The chances of- Alright, what the bloody hell was that? The Flash? That was absolutely another ship emerging from FTL pretty close by. And that was an EMP burst knocking out one of my engines, the cheeky bastards. So, this is an actual, real-life act of piracy occurring here? It sure appears that way. Well... Shit. Attention all crew. Repeat, attention all crew. This is the captain. It would appear we're being maliciously engaged by another vessel. Stand by to repel borders. Repel borders? We're in the bloody mess hall. Repel them with what? Cutlery and offensive language? Well, I'm sorted. What the hell is that? That is a size 18 torque wrench. Usually I'd be using this to tighten the restraining bolts on the engine manifolds. But you can also break heads with it. Don't suppose you've got any more of those on you, have you? Sal, how does this normally go down? Well, I expect they'll launch an umbilical tether. There you go. Next, they'll extend a pressurized boarding tunnel, then start hacking through the hull. Where will they try and get in? If they've got any sense, near the bridge. You capture that, you control the ship. 
Oh shit, they're breaking through! We're all going to die! Oh, shit up, Lawrence! Grab a blaster! A blaster? I've never fired one of these in my life! For God's sake, don't point it at us! Point it over there! Well, you all keep it together. Seriously, people. Attention, all crew. We're preparing for a firefight. I've initiated a lockdown of all decks. The helm has been locked out, so if they get through us, you should immediately counter-strike and take them all out. Stand by, everyone. There they are. Open fire! You pirate bastard scum! You <laughs> gotta hand it to him. He knows how to be dramatic. Look out! Behind you! Shit! Good shot, Mills. You took his bloody head off. I do like that. He's impressive. Ah, ah, ah. Yes! Mm, unbelievable! First sight of blood and he pursues! What a dick! Keep fighting! We're cutting them down! Captain, look out! The laser fire has stopped. Attention, all crew! We've taken heavy casualties, but we repelled the boarding party. They are disengaging! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> Yeah! But we lost the captain, first and second officers, and the chief astral navigator. Ooh. Ooh. Shit, there's still one hostile aboard. He's got away from the bridge. Looks like he's heading down corridor 5E towards the mess hall. Right, I got this. <laughs> Suck on that! Shit! He's gonna feel that in the morning. This is Engineer McLean to bridge. Hostile has been neutralized. Repeat, hostile is down. She bashed his face in with a giant spanner. That's the most awesome thing I've ever seen. Damn, she's hot. She'd eat you alive, Scraggy. No, I wouldn't complain. Christ, look at him. You'd think he'd be happy. Relieved, at least. I mean, the danger is over. The ship is safe. But he looks even more depressed than before. I know. He looks like he's just watched his pet dog being euthanized. Danny, you miserable bastard, stop gazing at that bloody star. Come and chill out. Contrary to what Scraggy and Sal thought, I wasn't just moping about looking longingly at the majesty of Antares and Antares B. My mind was actually racing. This ain't right. What's not right? We're too close. What are you talking about, Danny? We jumped here and ended up at a closer than optimal range. We're in the star's gravity field, and without another FTL jump, we can't break away from it. That's for the bridge crew to worry about, Danny. We're just skid marks. It ain't our problem. But we should have jumped by now, otherwise we'll be trapped. Well, they have been busy on the bridge. I reckon if we don't jump within the next few minutes, we're screwed. Even an FTL thrust won't have enough power to pull us out. We'll be drawn into the star. I'm sure they got this, Danny. Don't sweat it. Attention, all crew! See? This is them probably announcing we're about to jump. Following the unfortunate deaths of the captain and other senior bridge officers, I can report that in his capacity as the most senior remaining member of the crew, Senior Bridge Office Timble is now acting commander of the ship. Well, that sucks, Balls. That guy is a pompous fuckwit. Yeah, the feel-good factor didn't last long. And can any personnel with an E5 or higher rating on astro navigation please report to the bridge immediately? Oh, shit. They had two astral navigators on the bridge. We know the chief navigator died in the pirate raid, but they've got a spare. Why would they need another one? What if the deputy died as well, or, or was incapacitated? That would explain why we haven't jumped again yet. Danny, get your ass up to the bridge! It's weird. Previously, I felt like I belonged on the bridge. I was aggrieved to not be there, wallowing in self-pity at my own downfall. But as I stood outside the door, I felt apprehension. 
Morgan and Timber had both made it clear to me previously that I didn't belong there. Seriously? Clearly I was so unwelcome that my ship credentials didn't even permit me to open the door to the bridge, let alone enter. But given the change in circumstances, there was only one way to find out. Danny, oh thank god, come in. We're in a massive spot of bother right now. Hold it right there. Keen, what the hell is the skid mark doing on the bridge? This is an emergency. Get him the hell out of here. Commander, Danny might just be able to- Be able to do what? Vacuum clean the bloody console? Fine, I'm out of here. Danny, wait. Lawrence, you know full well we need a navigator. That's Commander Timble, thank you very much. And I'm sure Walton will be able to handle this. Walton is at the med bay, having what's left of his arm stitched back on. He's off his face on Morphin. He's not going anywhere. Well, that explained what happened to the deputy navigator. That confirmed it. They definitely needed my help, or we were all dead. It's no problem. I'll navigate the ship myself. Oh, bloody hell. Commander. Lawrence. Commander, with all due respect, you couldn't find your own backside with both hands in the aid of a map. I had to hand it to her. She had a wonderful way with words. Danny is the only other person on this ship who could possibly calculate a safe FTL jump. But... He's a skid mark. He was the best astral navigator the Academy has ever produced. I was still very bitter towards Morgan over the Big Dipper incident and his subsequent betrayal of our friendship. And I'm sure he was only doing this mostly to save his own skin, as usual. But it did feel good to have him fighting my corner again. But... God damn it, Lawrence! Enough! As a senior member of the Breach Crew, I invoke Space Regulation 325. A senior Breach Officer can override the commanding officer in a critical situation providing they have the unanimous backing of the other remaining senior Breach Officers. Morgan, do you concur? Hell yes! You can't be serious, this is mutiny! When we get back to the home planets, my report on this will ruin you all. Shut up, Commander! Yeah, don't be a dick, Tin Balls. Exactly. Lawrence, one more word of your mouth and so help me God. I'll shoot you, do you understand? Danny, we've got only about a minute before we hurtle into that star. Get us the hell out of here. And with that, with me being back in the navigator's chair, the apprehension, the feelings of rejection, the bitterness, it all vanished. I entered the trance-like state of the Astral Navigator once again. The overlays of three-dimensional galactic charts sprang forth in front of my eyes like familiar old friends greeting me at an emotional reunion. I'd been torn apart, but suddenly I was whole again. Okay, 30 seconds Danny. It's now or never. Stand by for FTL. Standing by. Course calculated. Ready. On my mark. Three, two, one. Mark. Roger that. It's all about propulsion. Oh, shut up and push the bloody button. Right, yes. Sorry. And that was that. I, Danny Ace Oswald, hotshot astral navigator turned lowly skid mark, had returned from the void, rising like a phoenix from the flames. I executed an absolutely textbook, perfectly calculated short-range FTL jump, taking the ship safely beyond the deadly gravitational pull of the binary star. It's safe to say that after that, life on board the endless endeavour changed for me. Despite threatening me with the most severe disciplinary action he could think of, Tin Balls never came to terms with his own bridge crew unceremoniously bypassing his authority. He subsequently suffered a massive mental breakdown. He was relieved of duty on psychiatric grounds and confined to quarters under constant medical supervision. Mills, being next in line of the officer hierarchy, took over acting command of the ship. Poor Officer Walton, the understudy who should have been navigating the ship after the unfortunate death of the chief navigator, while surviving the piracy incident, he was also deemed medically unfit for duty for the foreseeable future. That left yours truly as the only person qualified to navigate the ship through FTL travel for the remainder of the mission. I was elevated to being the most valuable member of the crew, all in a matter of minutes. 
Cheeseman wasn't impressed. In his true bureaucratic fashion, he demanded that I return to my duties, citing me for dereliction of duty, caused, no doubt, by my delusions of grandeur. Mills put a stop to that instantly by threatening to shoot him too. She could be incredibly persuasive when she was holding a gun to someone's face. And so my redemption was complete. When the Endless Endeavour returns to the home planets, it will be me at the navigation helm, in the face of my actions and proven and impeccable single-handed navigation of the most advanced starship ever built, it's likely there will be no opposition to my full reinstatement. I'd slaved for five long years at the Academy, breaking records and earning my place on this ship, only to have it all taken away from me. I'd spent months doing the worst job imaginable in the sheer hope that I might be granted a second chance, and fortune had finally smiled upon me. When the opportunity presented itself, I grabbed it, and nothing will take that away from me ever again. Computer scientists at the Space Academy Research Institute announced a historic breakthrough earlier today as they publicly unveiled the Universal Navicom GP bot, hailed as the most significant scientific achievement for a generation. It's believed to be the first computer AI capable of calculating the Arenberg principle at over 100 times the accuracy of a human. It's thought that its widespread adoption could make the role of a human astral navigator on starships completely obsolete almost overnight. Initial trials will begin shortly on the home planet's flagship vessel, the Endless Endeavour, as soon as it makes its scheduled return from its current deep space mission. You've been listening to Strange New Worlds and Spaced Out Tales. Episode 5, The Arenberg Principle, was written by Jim Cogan and starred John Kennard as Danny Ace Oswald, Ronnie Ng as Sally Sal McLean, Topher Bishop as Pete Scraggy Burns, Stephen Newhand as Officer Morgan Thruster Keen, Anna Gasaka as Officer Kaylee Mills, Wojciech Matras as Senior Sanitation Supervisor Gordon Cheeseman and the news announcer, and Jim Cogan as Senior Bridge Officer Lawrence Timbles Timble, Captain Ironside, and the Careers Coordinator. Production and sound design were by Jim Cogan. Sound effects and incidental music were licensed from Envato Elements and the theme music was written by Jim Cogan. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please do leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And until next time, thanks for listening.